Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we lived up in Massachusetts, which was up until a couple of years ago, I had a, a favorite mechanic who would take care of our cars. And in his garage, he had a sign hanging up. Maybe you've seen a similar one hanging up. It said, good, quick, cheap. Pick any two out of three. <laughs> and it's certainly true, isn't it? If when you need a car to be worked on, or really any maintenance work done, you can get good and quick, but it's not going to come cheap. Or you can get good and cheap, but it won't be quick. Or you could pick quick and cheap, but it's not going to be good. The sign points out the reality of priorities in our own lives. Anytime that we have decisions that need to be made, we need to know what our priorities are. And the more complex the decision, the more complex our lives, the more complex the world we inhabit, the more important it becomes to know where our priorities lie. Just like that sign, good, quick, and cheap, pick two out of three. You need to know where your priorities lie. When politicians are elected, particularly presidents, you know, we, we're going to elect a new president in a few years' time, which means for the next couple of years we will be treated to an endless barrage of advertising and so forth as we go through another election cycle. But once that's completed, and we've all survived it once again, we'll start that period that all of the commentators and observers look at, that first 100 days, right? Not because the president will necessarily accomplish or complete a whole lot of work in that first 100 days, but it sets the tone. It sets the vision. It proclaims to the country and to the world what the priorities are. Today, in a sense, in our Bible passage from Matthew, we're getting to observe Jesus' first 100 days. We're getting to observe the very, very beginning of his ministry, because as we pick up here, he's been baptized, he's been tempted in the wilderness, and now his ministry proper is really beginning, and we get to see where his priorities lie. And for those of us who have been called by Christ, who have been made new in our baptism, as we confess in the, in, in the liturgy itself, his priorities and ours, well, they probably ought to look fairly similar. So in an increasingly complex world where priorities become a very important topic, we get a chance today to see what Jesus' number one priorities were. And we see three of them in today's passage. First, in verses 12 through 17, we see that Jesus issues a call to repentance. That was John the Baptist's message, whom we've talked about the last couple of weeks. This message of repenting. And what is repenting? We haven't defined it. Repenting is understanding that what you've done is wrong, feeling genuinely sorry for what you've done, and making an effort, a pledge, not to continue that behavior. The Greek root even, even includes this idea. It literally means after knowing. It's what you do after you know what it is that you've been doing and how wrong it has been. So it involves this, all of this. It's apologizing, yes, and it's a commitment to change. That was Jesus' first message. John had been arrested for his unwillingness to compromise, his call to repentance. Jesus now picks it up. The first words that we read from Jesus as part of his proper ministry are repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then he goes on. He goes on and he walks along the Sea of Galilee and he sees some people who by now he ought to recognize and they ought to recognize him. Remember, right after his baptism, Andrew and one other apostle, who we believe probably to be the apostle John, had seen Jesus and had gone and talked to their siblings about who he was and taken them to meet him as well. That's what we talked about last week. So Jesus now returns to Andrew and Simon and to James and John and he issues them a new call. Not to repentance, but a call to the gospel, a call to live lives that are completely redefined by Christ and what he does. They're fishermen, and he calls them to be fishers of men. He calls them to go forth with him and to proclaim the gospel, the gospel that comes in after repentance has been proclaimed. See, repentance involves teaching people what they've done wrong. It involves making people sorry for their sins and then announcing to them that forgiveness is offered as a free gift through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus came with his call to repentance. We know that was one of his number one priorities. But it's immediately followed with a call to the gospel. A call to a new life which is centered and totally redefined by Christ and what he does. And now joined by the first of his disciples, he goes out and he issues one other call. A call to his kingdom. His kingdom of healing. His kingdom of new life. He goes out and defeats diseases and afflictions and pains and even demon possessions. He doesn't defeat them by entering into toe-to-toe -to -toe combat and coming out just a little bit ahead on the judge's scorecard. They flee from his presence. Because Jesus is the creator of health, so sickness cannot abide, cannot survive in his presence. Jesus is the creator of good. Evil cannot survive or abide in his presence. And Jesus is the creator of life, so death cannot abide, cannot survive in his presence. Jesus comes and he begins his ministry, and we see these three priorities on full display immediately. A call to repentance, a call to the gospel, and then a call to the kingdom of healing and life that is found in Christ. Jesus' work hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 2,000 years. Those priorities that he set in his first 100 days in office, in his first efforts of ministry, remain his number one priorities. And the testimony to this truth is our own lives. Jesus comes to us and by his spirit convicts us that we are sinners. That's why we confess it as the very first thing in the liturgy. We might as well get it out of the way with no pretense at all. We sin. We do not deserve life. We deserve damnation. And yet we immediately cry out to God through the Kyrie for mercy. And that mercy is proclaimed to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we move from the call to repentance, which God issues into every one of our lives, for we are all sinners. We are sinners by our very nature, for we were born into sin, and we're sinners by the decisions that we made. If I asked for a show of hands, how many of you made it all the way through this week without sinning at all? The same number of hands would ought to be up as are up right now, which is zero. We know that we still inhabit sinful bodies and live in a sinful world, and our natural tendency is not toward good and self-sacrifice, but toward sin. So Jesus still comes into our lives with a call to repentance, but he immediately follows that with a call to the gospel, a call to center our lives, not on what we do or how we try to earn his pleasure, but on what he has done, how he has taken our sin upon himself and died and put that sin to death with him and raised himself into new life, conquering sin and death. That's still his priority, to proclaim a call to repentance and then a call to the gospel and then to deliver his call to the kingdom, the kingdom of health and life. Many well-meaning brothers and sisters in the faith have misunderstood this a little bit have proclaimed that if we would just follow Jesus and who he is, then we would never face hardship. We would be healthy and happy, and financially we would be well off, presumably until you die. And, and then your death would be quick, painless, and, and during the night, so you wouldn't know that it happened. Some have taught this gospel of blessings. Come to Christ so that you can be well off in all of your relationships and all of your finances, and in everything you'll never have any hardship. But we know that to not be true. We know that our bodies fail us. We know that our relationships can and do fall apart. And we know that at the end of this journey, death does await. So how can I say that Jesus universally issues this call to healing and to life, this call to the kingdom? Because Jesus makes it plain to us that those things, in the end, they don't really matter. In the end, those things will not exist. And he still will. In the end, life will conquer death. Health will conquer sickness. Good will conquer evil. For when Jesus returns and reigns as he promises to do, when he calls us all to be with him, then his priorities will be the only priorities that exist. His life will define all of life. His goodness will define all of life. Our health and well-being will be his health and well-being. And for those who have gone before us, they've already entered that eternity where time does not exist. They no longer have to await anything. But that's their new reality. That life 
has conquered death, that wellness has conquered sickness, that good has conquered evil. These are the priorities of Jesus' ministry 2,000 years ago, and they're the priorities of his ministry even now. And then that being said, what should our priorities be? If I had the chance to look into anybody's bank book or telephone records or day timer, what would it look like your priorities are? And would those priorities align with the new reality that we've been given in Christ? Because I believe our priorities ought to be exactly the same as Christ's. To proclaim the truth, which involves issuing a call to repentance where there is sin. Where there is something wrong, we don't paper over it. We proclaim it as what it is. A failure of this life, of this world, and the sinners that inhabit it. We're free to announce that because we follow it with a call to the gospel. That this life and this world and the sinners who inhabit it all have been redeemed by Christ and his sacrifice. Those realities are not our ultimate realities. And so ultimately we issue a call to the kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, where health and life will rule and reign forever. Those are Christ's priorities 2,000 years ago. They're Christ's priorities in your own life. And I believe because of that, they ought to be our priorities in this world. To speak the truth, issuing a call to repentance wherever evil or sin still exist but also to speak the truth of the redemption that comes through Christ's sacrifice, and then to make every effort to issue a call to the kingdom of Christ, to demonstrate his love and his grace and his healing and his generosity to all who are in need. Like that sign in the mechanic's shop, good, quick, or cheap, pick any two. We have to decide what our priorities are when we face a complex world. These were Jesus' priorities. Repentance from sin, and then a call to the pure gospel that's given in Jesus Christ, and then a demonstration in love of what Christ's kingdom is like. True life, true health, true well-being. Those were Jesus' priorities. May it be our prayer today that his priorities would truly be our priorities. That as we go forth from this place as a church body and as individuals into our schools and our homes and our families and our workplaces, that we would carry these priorities, repentance and the gospel and the kingdom of life into all that we do. And may the grace of God and the peace of God that pass all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this truth in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.